Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the centennial celebration of the practice school. As you can see, from 70 years ago, the uh, goals have not changed. The practice school is still as vital and vibrant as ever. We have folk like Herb Kay that uh, have been very, very successful. I'd like to attribute all to the practice school, and I think he does too. Uh, but we'll see as we go through the day, it's uh, been a marvelous program, and we'll see a lot more from the what's happened in the last uh, 70 years as well. So uh, do a welcome, as I said, to the practice school at Centennial. It's a great event for us. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know me, who weren't at the uh, event last night, I'm Alan Hatton. I'm the uh, director of the practice school program. I took on this task in 1989 just for a three-year appointment. It's been, the longest, <laughs> it's been the longest three years I've ever experienced. But it, it's been a wonderful three years, and obviously uh, it's something I, I, I feel very privileged to have uh, been able to, to do. We have a full day of programming today. Uh, we'll get into uh, it shortly. But I think it'd be nice to get to know you all, see who's here, where you're from, how long you've been here, when did you go through the practice school, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to ask a few questions. I'd like you to raise your hands with gusto. And, um, how many current students, how many students currently in the program at MIT are in the audience today? So we have a fairly large number. That is good, yes. So, so you are the ones that are going to take us into the second century of the practice school. So, um, I really encourage the alums or those of you that have been through the program in many years ago, and maybe not so many years ago, to, to get to know these youngsters and, and to impart upon them your, your wisdom and how to survive the program. <laughs> uh, okay, how, how many students here, how many of the alums have graduated in, 20, in, the last, uh, in this decade, say, between from 2010 to 2016? There have got to be a few of you, yes? Good, good. Great, you're not showing from a recent alumni. How many alums from the, uh, the millennial years, 2000, 2009? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, how many from the 1990 to 1999, the end of the last century? Good, okay. Um, and then we get to the, uh, those marvelous tester years during the <laughs> 1980s. Uh, I'd like to see a show of hands here. Good. Yeah, very good crowd. That's great. Um, we, had, we had people at stations like Bethlehem Steel, at GE in Albany, at Brookhaven National Labs, and at other, other places as well. Uh, of course, we can go back a little bit further now when we think about uh, in the 1970s, American Cyanamid in the Oak Ridge area. Uh, good. Very strong showing here. Thank you. And then we get back to the uh, red jacket uh, crowd. Uh, back to American Cyanamid and, and SO Standard Oil uh, from no, 1960s. Wow, that's a nice showing. That's great. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and now for the most remarkable group, how many practice school alumni here graduated before 1959? Wow, that is a great crew. Thank you. You left Oak Ridge. Pardon? You left down Oak Ridge. OK. Well, Oak Ridge, all right. Stand up. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll get to that. OK, who, who went to Oak Ridge? Most of you. Right. It's, it's a great legacy that you've left for the rest of us. Yeah. Um, these are people that you worked at Hercules Powder Company, at Eastern Manufacturing up in Bangor, Maine, a Carbon Common Company, and the Lackawanna Steel in Buffalo. I've really been enthralled by all the stories that we've read about the group in the practice school book. How many of you have actually taken a look at the book? Those wonderful interviews that really are revealing, very exciting, and they bring out all sorts of aspects of the program and of the people involved in that in a very, very uh, erudite manner. Thank you. Um, I hope that you don't take time to swap stories of your own over the weekend with uh, your, your friends, with strangers, and the like. I think it'd be very important for us to get those stories and get them circulating. 
It's part of the law of the practice school. Now, by the official account, we have more than 40 alumni registered to graduate in the last five years. 33 registered to graduate in the last 50, who uh, graduated more than 50 years ago. So that's a huge number. Okay, I'm going to break it down a little bit more and see uh, how many of you had to get on a plane to get here today? That, that shows your dedication and the like. I really appreciate it. That's wonderful. For, for me, this is not too much of a problem. I live just down the road, so I could get here quite easily, although I think a number of my students would have expected me to have just got enough a plane as well, because <laughs> I do tend to spend a fair amount of time traveling, mainly in practice school business. Um, how many people flew in from another country? That's a really great showing. Thank you. Thank you for making the effort. I, I, I think we, we had a, a, a tally of, about, of alumni from 11 different countries here today. That, that's really a, an amazing uh, event. Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's important to recognize that the practice school is not a US institution by any means. We have always had a very strong cohort of folk from around the world uh, going back uh, many, many decades. And so this is really a wonderful reflection of, of how global we have been, even before globalization became an important component of our lives. Um, I'm going to shift to demographics a little bit. How many women here graduated after the year 2000? All right. Thank you. Um, how many women graduated between 1990 and 1999? Not a good representation of that crowd. There were a lot of women in the group at that time. I, I, I don't have the numbers. I'll show you a little later what the numbers were. Um, looking 30 years out, how many women graduated between 1980 and 1989, the famous tester years? All right. Is, is it Jeff that brought you out here? Or? No. Oh. Hmm? Don't ask. Don't ask. That's good. Uh, yeah. And how many do we have from the 1970s? Thank you, thank you. Uh, according to the data, we have 12 women who graduated from the program prior to 1975, with the earliest being in 1957. I think that number's right. Yeah. Uh, and you can see, looking around, this has changed significantly since then. Uh, and I'll share a little bit more about the gender distribution and trends in, in my remarks this afternoon. Um, but suffice it to say, I'm thrilled to see chemical engineering as a field doing more to attract these gifted young women. And I know that Paula Hammond, the first woman to head the department, joins me in this sentiment. Uh, we heard from her last night. She's very dynamic and excited about the program, excited about the practice school, just excited about chemical engineering in general and our students. Uh, we have some major challenges in society. We need every bright mind working on, on them. OK, I have to now go on and introduce uh, I've got the introductions out of the way, but I'd, we need to say a few words about housekeeping. What are we going to be doing today, and why are we doing it? This morning, we have some wonderful discussions lined up for you, which are going to explore the changing practice school experience over the decades and over the years, with alumni from as far back as 1959 and as recently as 2013, all participating. So we'll get the good spectrum of experiences over the decades as well as some voices from giving the industrial perspective. Now, why has the practice school been so important to them as well? What does it deliver? Uh, we will be screening a new documentary. We did not only prepare the book that you have all received, but we also have a documentary uh, looking at the practice school and how the practice school works. Um, it, will be, it was constructed from more than 30 filmed interviews of practice school alumni, the directors, and the host partners as well as footage recorded on site with our students in Corning, New York. Uh, we recorded hundreds of hours of footage for this, and you'll be seeing some snippets throughout the day, not just the documentary, but other little snippets. And tonight at the at gala dinner, there'll be a, a loop of these various uh, segments that we've recorded and developed. I do want to thank Corning Glass for having allowed us on site. I believe that when the students first showed up with cameramen in tow, everybody was absolutely shocked. Because when you go to Corning, you're not allowed to take your iPhone on, on site because of, of photographs. So they really made a, a big effort to help us develop this um, documentary that you'll see shortly. Uh, in the afternoon, we will have, I don't think we need to introduce them, but uh, Jeff Tester, Ken Smith, and uh, Monty Alger. 
They were joining us for a deep dive into the practice school and the efforts to strengthen the program in the 1980s. And I will close out today by, with some remarks of where we are and where we may be going. I, I must have personally, I, I was very gratified that they did that. So when Jeff finally twisted my arm to take over the program from him when he got tapped to run the energy lab, uh, he left me with a really fine program. And all I had to do was just be his caretaker. And it's been a privilege to be the caretaker. Uh, I know we're all looking forward to the uh, gala dinner at the Media Lab, but uh, prior to that, the department would like to showcase some of its own activities, the research activities. Some of you may be interested in knowing what are we doing in the department. You may like to see the renovations that have gone on. Uh, how many of you actually were in the department prior to building 66? Okay, a significant fraction of you. How many of you visited building 66 over the last decade or two? How many of you have seen it in the last couple of years? OK, fair number. So you see, there's been some changes. It's been uh, modified. It's, it's, um, the, uh, it's been updated and the like. Uh, but anyway, what we'd like you to do, there are about eight or nine uh, different stations, you might say, in the department where students are giving um, uh, demonstrations of the research they're doing and can tell you about the excitement of the work that's going on in the department. So I really hope you'll take the time to visit these. Um, <clears throat> we will begin wrapping up with an informal brunch tomorrow morning from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., 12 noon. There won't be any formal activities then. Show up, come down your PJs if you wish. It'll be here in this room, and uh, it'll be a very informal occasion just to say goodbye. Au revoir, I think, not goodbye. Uh, and lastly, you might guess I don't plan and execute this event by myself. And before we begin, there are some people I need to thank for the heroic efforts, and they really were heroic in making this weekend possible. First, I want to thank the members of the Chemical Engineering Administrative Staff who served on our planning committee. In particular, I'd like to thank Beth Tutts, my assistant. She's the one that actually runs the practice. I echo that applause, that she'd been a wonderful assistant over the last 15 years or so. But she really is the one that runs the program. I, I'm just a tight figurehead. Um, Melanie Kaufman, who's been very responsible for the, uh, a lot of the um, advertising and the like. Rebecca Halu, who's uh, the development officer. She's done a remarkable job in pulling together and choreographing this whole event today, along with uh, somebody else I'll mention in a short while. And they put a lot of hours, countless hours, into making this weekend a reality and hopefully a real successful reality. I'd also like to thank Greg Batchelor for the Alumni Association, who de deserves thanks for helping prepare our communications and overseeing our registration website. And we need to thank the members of the documentary team. You'll see the documentary shortly. Chris Babel, he's an Emmy Award winner, by the way, a regional Emmy Award winner. So that's kind of nice. We had good talent here. Joe McMaster. Jean Denoyer and Toby McElney, as well. And uh, Beth Doherty. Beth Doherty is the one that put together the uh, book that we all received in practice. She did a remarkable job taking the interviews, distilling them down, and really putting them into a very readable form that I think you'll find uh, you'll get much enjoyment from in years to come. Uh, and reading and rereading all these uh, accounts of people's lives in, in the practice school. Uh, I want to thank Paul Monty. Paul Monty is, was responsible for the beautiful graphic design of the book and for all the design elements that we see around uh, outside and uh, this logo, and also the, uh, the general branding of this, this event. Uh, <coughs> Wendy Segal, Tom Peckman, and Craig Milanese have, have their work cut out for them, helping coordinate this event the event planning, the AV, and the video production that they're doing today. That's been a, a wonderful help. Without them, this would be a little bit of a shambles, I think. At least if it left to me, it would be a shambles. Um, two others I need to thank, uh, and these are alums and, and former directors of the Practice School program for their insight and their counsel on developing uh, this, this whole program. They are Sam Fleming and Jeff Tester. They were excellent in giving advice and, and help in developing the program. It's no easy thing to create a program that reflects 100 years of history, and they have been invaluable guides uh, to our team. With that, I'd like to welcome our first panel to come to the stage, if you would like to join us. 
Uh, this discussion will be moderated by Bob Hanlon, who will introduce our speakers. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I'd like to sort of okay. say a few things about Bob before he uh, settles down and, and gets comfortable. Well, you can settle down and be comfortable. I'll say a few things about you. I'll try not to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, Bob had re received his bachelor's degree in, uh, from Bucknell University before coming to MIT. He did his stations at Bethlehem Steel and GE Silicones and Oral Products, and then completed his, his SCD degree uh, with Chuck Satterfield on Fischer Tropes Catalysis. He worked for more than two decades as an engineer with Mobile Oil Research and Development and Roman Haas before returning to the practice school program in 2010 as a station director. And he ran stations for me for about five years. I try to persuade him for longer than that, but Bob is the last per is, is really the last person I want to thank today. Actually, that comes out badly. It sounds like I don't <laughs> want to thank him. Uh, let me start again. Bob has earned a strong thank you and appreciation for his tremendous efforts to put this program together. He has been the guiding light throughout the whole process for the last three to four years. Uh, he chaired the practice school centennial planning committee for this period as was among the first people here this morning, and I'm confident that he'll be the last person on the dance floor tonight. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Bob Hanlon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Um, we wanted to start off the day with uh, our first program, uh, reflecting back on what practice school was like then and what versus what practice school is like now. There have been some uh, changes over time. Remarkably, there's been a lot of similarities between then and now, uh, but also some differences, and we wanted to flesh that out here this morning. And so we, we chose a then and now representative uh, to help us out. Uh, from the then side, uh, we have uh, Kishore Marawala, uh, graduated in uh, uh, 1959, and Leah uh, Pokorus, who graduated in 2013. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and what we wanted to do here is to um, have a conversation around this uh, uh, with, with uh, Kishore and Leah. And perhaps we could just first start with having uh, Kishore and Leah introduce themselves what it was that led them to practice school to begin with and where they went, and then we'll start the conversation from there. So with that background, Kishore, perhaps you could just give us a brief background on how you ended up. Yes, I was, uh, I was, I was born and I've been living in Bombay since then, ever since then, except for these two and a half years at MIT. I was born in a family which has been in trading for 70 years then, trading in commodities. Uh, it was expected in those times that I would join the family business. However, trading never really inspired me, never really excited me. And I was good at sciences, so I started thinking about going into some sort of engineering, which I could lend my support to the family business in diversifying into manufacturing. Uh, I had a high school teacher in uh, Bombay who really inspired me with chemistry, and that's why I decided on going for chemi chemical engineering. And since I was to join the family business, I thought the best thing for me would be to join, take, take up the practice school rather than taking, take on any, going, going for any research or PhD work. Uh, my undergraduate studies were in Bombay Institute of Chemical Technology, where I got my Bachelor of Chemical Engineering, and then I came to MIT. And I obviously, because the reason is given, I selected Chemical Engineering Practice School. <laughs> Excellent, Great. thank you. Leah? Yeah, so I'm, I grew up uh, in a small town outside of Paris in France, um, raised by an American mother, French father. Uh, my father's an astrophysicist, so as uh, a young um, girl, I guess, we conducted a lot of experiments, whether it be in the kitchen or in the garden or upstairs, mm -hmm. kind of anywhere. And I think my father really tried to instill in my sister and I this curiosity and, and love of science. And what I realized when I was growing up is that I actually preferred the application of science, um, and that led me naturally to engineering. Um, I chose chemical engineering specifically because it was really at the intersection of biology, chemistry, math, and physics, and I enjoyed those four disciplines tremendously. 
went on to um, move from France to, to Canada, uh, Montreal, where I attended McGill for my undergraduate studies. And they were actually pretty theoretical, I think more so than, than MIT's chemical engineering program, and was looking for really the, m being more applied in my studies. And I really like MIT's philosophy of both the knowledge and the practice of the knowledge. And chemical engineering practice school was kind of a natural fit, given my, my desire to, to really apply chemical engineering. Excellent, excellent. So we did a little prep work beforehand to, uh, to find out what the similarities and the differences were. So I wanted to start with the first similarity that you both identified, uh, and that is, and we heard it from her, you know, in the video here on teamwork and your experience with learning about teamwork in practice school. So, Kishore, perhaps could you share? Yeah, I had, I had some experience in teamwork in high schools, essentially because in high schools and in my undergrad studies, we had to write papers, and those two or three students had to get together and write a paper. But that teamwork was slightly different than what we experienced at the practice school. At practice school, one had to take into consideration the strength and the weaknesses of the team members and assign work or, or allocate work according to the strength and the weaknesses of the person concerned. So that was one aspect of it. Uh, that was, I, I would say, the major aspect. And that has which stood me well in my entire career. Because when I started manufacturing in India, manufacturing activities in India, I had to form teams, I had to set up an organization, and this is what came in very handy at, uh, to me at that time. Oh. Excellent. Yeah, I think obviously the team component of practice school, I'm sure you'll all appreciate, is, is such an integral part of it. And I think one of the things that I really loved about practice school is the uniformity of strength among team members. So previously in my undergrad, um, different, there, there were different levels of motivation. I think some people were a lot more motivated than others. <laughs> and, and in practice school, and that's something I had to get used to when I, when I arrived at MIT, is everyone was just so motivated. And, and so given, given that, I think what we tried to play to, and I think, um, Kishore, you touched on this, is really each person's strength, strengths in the team. So for example, if we were doing, if part of the project involved an experimental setup and part of the project involved um, modeling on, say, MATLAB, then we would divide um, those two tasks according to, to the individual's strengths. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. The, um, another similarity, and every alumni has gone through this, and uh, you may have seen this on one of the short videos that we sent out before the meeting, the, the oral presentation that we all dreaded, uh, especially when we first went there. Could you share a little bit? Uh, and of course, that has stayed true for 100 years. Um, <laughs> could you share, Kishore, a little bit about your experience with the oral presentation and learning about that? In a, in yes. Now, the, the, again, in, as far as oral presentations are concerned, I was, to some extent, introduced to it in high school. However, the oral presentations that we had to make at practice school were different in the sense <laughs> that they had to be crisp, they had to be time bound. Not only that, but your presentation could be challenged and you had to be prepared to defend what you're talking about. You know, or accept, the, if you have committed an error, accept that you have committed an error. In high school presentations, there was never like anything like challenges. This is one thing which was very important, different from the high school presentations that I learned in high school. Excellent. Yeah, I think the emphasis on presentation, whether it be when you're presenting your proposal or at the end of the project, presenting your final results, is, is so critical and it's something that is just getting that presentation practice has served me really well. I know that um, over the last couple of years, I worked in energy consulting. So similar kind of to, to practice school where you have a certain project, it's time bound, you have to put together a proposal, um, check in with the client on a regular basis uh, with updates, and then deliver a final presentation. And I think that the experience I gained in practice school with just getting used to present on a very re regular basis has served me well in my career thus far. Super. Excellent. May I add one more point? Absolutely. You know, uh, in the beginning at the practice school, it was very intimidating to make a presentation to somebody who has been running a plant for a few years. And uh, that, 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 that was one, one strength which I gained over there. That, that, that don't get intimidated by whosoever is the, or your is that, that was a very important lesson I learned over there. Uh, yes. <laughs> 
So other similarities, I know, Leo, you had mentioned um, uh, one of the things you learned was uh, the importance of communication. Mm -hmm. And Kishore, I, I'm guessing is the same for you. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, so in my undergrad studies, I'd been very, um, had done a lot of work just alone and, and wasn't really accustomed to, to having to having stakeholders to, to please, really. And what I realized through the practice school experience, and it, I realized this through doing it wrong, <laughs> and this was actually a project. Um, so I, I did two stations. One was at Cabot Chemicals in Villarica, and the second one was at Novartis Pharmaceuticals in San Carlos. And for my first project at Cabot Chemicals, where we were studying the mixing of two coaxial fluids, carbon black slurry and latex, um, we had a project sponsor with very high expectations for us. And what I realized one or two weeks in is that he was relatively unhappy with the progress that we were making. And I, I didn't really understand because it felt like we were working so hard. I mean, during the day we were running experimental setups and uh, experiments. In the evening we were analyzing the results and trying to compare that with what theory would predict. And I, I just didn't get it. And what I ended up realizing from having a conversation with him is that he didn't know what we were doing because we weren't checking in with him or communicating to him what we were doing on a daily basis. And so that made me realize the importance of over-communicating. So from then onward, we'd check in with him on a daily basis to let him know exactly the progress we'd made. And he was a lot happier <laughs> after that. Excellent. Kishore? Yeah, for me, the communication was Again, sort of a lot of uh, big learning process from the culture that I come from, from the Oriental culture. When you are communicating, usually it is expected that you don't contradict anyone directly. That's one thing, you know. So you are, you are supposed to be very polite in this thing. However, when you are communicating facts, you at times you not at times, very often you have to contradict. The, if you don't agree with the facts, you have to contradict. And this is one important lesson for me personally that I learned to communicate the differences openly and without being hostile, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? You were, were you going to add no, on to no, that? No, I'm just curious, because I think there's also a cultural element to, to communication. And I think practice school is also helpful in that teams tend to be multicultural uh, and stations can yeah. be in different locations. And so I think that adapting one's communication style to wherever we are geographically or to whoever is on our team nationality-wise is important and learn through practice school as well. So you have to learn within your team how to communicate That's right. well. Because mm -hmm. I can see sometimes, I have seen sometimes teams go their own way with, with no communication and then <laughs> disaster at the end of the week, you know? Oh, I didn't know you were doing that, you know? So, I mean, did you share the same? Y yeah, I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say anything. <laughs> But that is a that is a challenge, and, yeah. and uh, you know the communication is an inherent part of the, the whole program learning. So I won't pursue that further. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. I wanted to go over to the differences, and it was kind of interesting because we actually had a difficult time identifying the differences. I mean, one of the clear and easy things um, was the difference in the tools, the tools you have to work with, and the the tools from you know back in '59 versus the tools of today. How, I'm curious how that has changed. Oh, what a difference, because first and foremost is all the analysis that we had to do with all essentially wet analysis. Uh, yes, gas chromatographs were being used. I don't think HPLC or quantitative TLC was ever being used over the, at that time. As far as computer is concerned, the only computer I got exposed to was one at the Standard oil refinery, and a huge big computer, probably with a capacity less than a smartphone today. And uh, <laughs> some of the boys used this. This was novelty. We were, we, were not, we were not used to computers. We were not used to calculators. It was essentially slide rules. That was one thing. Uh, was this the computer with the cards, the, the stack of cards? That's right. You have a you know, punch cards and the stack cards. of cards. That's right. And <laughs> some, of, some of the boys in our group did use it for multi-component installation. I did not get a chance to use it. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that it was there and it was being used. Uh, the, the mathematical tools we used were essentially formulae from Perry's Handbook of Chem Chemical Engineering or standard textbooks on mass and heat transfer. That's it. So basically, it was absolutely basic facilities compared to what they are available now. You know. Slide rule? 
slide rule, yes. That yeah. was the only, that's the, the, perhaps the most sophisticated tool we used was a slide rule, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> we saw those in the museum last <laughs> night, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it easy. I mean, we came in the post-2000s. Um, we were each handed a computer when we arrived at our different stations, which, <laughs> I mean, was incredibly helpful, both from um, providing us the tools really to do our analyses. So I remember using MATLAB and COMSOL for a project I did at Novartis, but also, honestly, for the reporting and presentations. We could start writing our report on pretty much week one and make edits to it as we went along, which I imagine is really different, Kishore, than, than in your day, where you probably had to handwrite the report. So, and yeah, we, hand no, the no, report. We, we had to try, put them or in typewriter. Type or typewriter, okay. <laughs> as, a, as a matter but of fact, my, my sons are now using their portable typewriter as a, as a collector, collector's item. They want it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you make a mistake, and you know, it's, a, it's, it's a much more tedious than when you have Word or you have PowerPoint. Oh, to, sure. Um, well, and also one of the things that I, um, one of the great assets nowadays is, you know, an inherent part of the project is to do the research on the technology that you're going to be involved with. And mm -hmm. with the internet today, mm -hmm. the research is, compared to the olden days, is much different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Did you take advantage of that at all in your projects, Leah, or? I, I I know that we did. Um, that being said, we did also have textbooks. I remember Bill Dozel, who's in the room, was one of our, our professors, and he came. I remember the first week he came to, to the project with at least four different chemical engineering textbooks. Being like, okay, go study these. Go figure out what the, the problem is from a theoretical perspective. Um, so yes, we did take advantage of the internet, while we also did use more traditional local, resources as well. The, um, another of the differences, and Alan had alluded to this earlier, was with the, uh, the demographics of the practice school mm -hmm. student. And um, you, you had mentioned back in 59, I believe it was all, all male, Kishore? It was all males. Uh, but we've, there, there was a quite, a, quite a spread of different countries. We had, a, we had a, one of the batchmates was from Colombia, one was from Philippines, one was from Greece, one was from uh, Japan, and I was from India. So that way, in a group of about 30, I think we were, we were six of us were from different countries, yes. Excellent. Leah? Yeah, I can touch on both of those. So first of all, from a, I guess, female, male perspective, we actually had a very unusual class, and I don't know if it's ever been replicated since or, or before that, but seven out of the 10 individuals in my class were, were female, which is really unheard of. <laughs> we did have a single yeah. female in our batch. No. <laughs> we made up for it. <laughs> you average it out. Doing pretty well. Um, and then from an international uh, uh, perspective, I think we, we probably had more Americans than you did, Kishore. We had five or six Americans, which is surprising. You'd think that things would evolve in the other yeah. way, but obviously we're just taking two data points. Um, I'm Franco-American, uh, Indian woman, uh, Chinese man. So, so, so some, um, I guess, international representation, yeah. but, but doesn't sound like as much as you had. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. The, um, uh, one of the other uh, differences that we had spoken about, and it kind of gets into all of this availability of the computers and the internet and the connectivity, is the, um, for lack of a better word, the increasing complexity of, mm -hmm. of life today. And um, with many options, many other things out there, and Leah, you had mentioned a little bit about the, the, the complexity. Do you want to yeah, yeah, talk a little absolutely. bit about that? Well, I think we see the increase in complexity in the field of chemical engineering. I, I was looking at some stats, and. According to Aki, in the 1970s, about 80% of individuals graduating from chemical engineering went into um, chemi the chemical process industries, whereas in the 2000s, it was only about 50%. And I think that's largely driven by just the expanse or the expanding areas that, that chemical engineers can go into, whether it be pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, nanotechnology, et cetera. And that's just when <clears throat> just looking at kind of like the sciences and engineering. But if you look at other options that are available to us, you, you may have witnessed this as well, but I think a lot of companies today or a lot of organizations today are willing to hire us or hire individuals if, if they know that they're smart. So I, I recently okay. graduated from, from Stanford's business school and the, the options that are available right now are completely overwhelming. I could join a startup in San Francisco right now. I could go work in, in consulting in um, 
in Europe or, or go maybe be part of Kishore's chemicals industry in, <laughs> in India. And I think that that can be really overwhelming. How do you choose a path forward when you have so many options? Kishore, was it overwhelming <laughs> when you graduated and you were looking at your options? No, at this is my option is because my options were pretty fixed because I wanted to join. The <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, I think that, you know, as far as uh, chemical engineers themselves are concerned, I think most of them went into processing industry or in consultation or in academics. I think mm. the, this was essentially the field. Okay. I, don't, I don't think many of them went into things like what, what, what happens right now about either, there was, I don't think many went into IT at that time. That, right. that's, I don't think many went into you know, you know, the diagnostics as being, as being done right now. But mm -hmm. essentially it was for chemical processing, consultation and academics. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Where, whereas I look at my class, um, folks graduated three, four years ago. One is a patent lawyer, another one is a programmer for Aetna Health, another one works in management consulting, another one's doing a PhD right now in chemical engineering, which is the more traditional one. But So out of curiosity, do you yeah. like the complexity? Do you like seeing so many options in your future, or is it overwhelming, or what? Uh, I, I mean, I think it can be overwhelming, and I think the downside of having so many options is that you choose one, and you can feel dissatisfied with it because you, you question whether or not it was the right choice, right choice to make. Or not. Yeah, exactly. There's a great TED talk actually called The Paradox of Choice, which covers on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is perhaps a good segue. One of the things that we wanted to end with here was, um, Kishore, uh, at this point in your life, you have wisdom uh, to share to perhaps younger generation. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> we need it. <laughs> Wisdom on, you know, re reflecting back, you know, what would you, um, what suggestions would you give to the younger I, generation? I, I personally think first and foremost is don't be afraid of failures. You know, failures teach a lot, particularly if the, all the fundamentals have been taken into consideration and an action has been taken. If it fails, yes, it gives you an additional clue as to what was, was missing. That is one thing. So never be afraid of failures. Secondly, is that this is an era which is there is an overwhelming flood of information. Don't get drowned in flood of information. Stick to your fundamentals and use the information. Whatever is used, only what what can be used, whatever additional information can be used, just use that. Don't get drowned in the flood of this information way we could say. Wait, wait. No. Excellent. Leia, are there any questions that you have uh, for Kishore on? <laughs> <laughs> what you should do next. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess, can you speak about, it, it seems like, so you started off in chemical engineering more in a technical capacity, and I think you moved in more into a management role. That's right. Can you speak a little bit about maybe how studying chemical engineering helped you in, in more of a management position? Uh, I will not, I, I don't know whether I can really articulate that or not, but it was a natural growth obviously because initially it was involved with the thinking up of the project, setting up the project, putting, get it going, looking after operations, and then get, gradually go on to the overall operations, overall management. So uh, I really, really, I'm, well, I, I, I would not be able to be able. It's yeah. been such a natural progress right. and progression that I, I don't particularly recount any stages, specific stages that I went through. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. It was an evolutionary process, basically, yes. We are at a point where we can uh, wrap up. If any of you would like to talk with Leia or Kishore um, afterwards at the breaks or whatnot, or seek more wisdom for, from Kishore on, <laughs> on future possibilities, um, please feel free to do so. Um, but that, that concludes uh, this, this uh, program one here this morning. Leia, Kishore, thank you very much. Thank for, you. For Thanks, Kishore.